But while Lumumba's revolutionary fervor kept his head in the clouds, one man who had his feet firmly on the ground was the young Joseph Desiré Mobutu. Sensing that Congo's independence was virtually inevitable, Mobutu joined Lumumba's party, Le Mouvement National Congolais, which was popularly known as the MNC. Despite his many years working as a part-time paid informant for the colonial police, Mobutu rebranded himself as a passionate Congolese nationalist, and within a short while, he struck up a close friendship with Lumumba and even became his personal assistant. In his new position, Mobutu began working alongside Lumumba as he petitioned the Belgian government for his country's independence. The negotiations for Congo's independence were not cordial. Lumumba and his associates gave the Belgian government a 30-day ultimatum to either organize elections and grant Congo's independence or risk an outbreak of violence. Scared by the prospect of a full-blown Algerian-style war of independence, the Belgians were forced to hastily concede to Lumumba's demands. Shaken and embarrassed by how quickly they had lost control of their precious colony, the Belgians would now turn their energies towards ensuring an independence in name only outcome, in which one of the more moderate pro Belgium Congolese parties would win the elections and enable the Belgians to continue running the country as they did prior to independence. But despite their best efforts, moderate parties did very badly at the elections, and in fact, no single party was able to win a majority in the country's new parliament. However, following some rather swift and rocky negotiations, Congo eventually achieved its independence on the 30th of June 1960 after a shaky coalition of 12 different parties agreed to a power-sharing arrangement. Congo began life as an independent state with a 35-year-old Patrice Lumumba as his first prime minister and Lumumba's arch-rival Joseph Kazavubu appointed as non-executive president. But like a young deer thrust into a den of hungry lions, Lumumba's Congo would be ripped apart before it could even find its feet. Violence and chaos in the Congo. Barely 11 days after official independence from Belgium, Congolese troops mutiny and begin a wave of attacks and looting throughout the far-flung sectors of the former colony. Meanwhile, in Belgium and in African countries bordering on the Congo, refugees are pouring in with harrowing tales of violence and of hasty flight. At least 10 Europeans were reported killed in a weekend of violence, with armed clashes in the key cities of Elizabethville, Stanleyville and Luaburg, which was to be the new nation's capital. At the request of Congolese officials, Belgian paratroops were recalled to quell the native army's mutiny and reign of terror, a harsh awakening to reality from golden dreams of independence. Within its first seven days as an independent state, an army revolt would break out into a fully-fledged civilian massacre as Lumumba's government struggled to control the situation. Sensing blood, opposition parties immediately began questioning the legitimacy of Lumumba's government and a number of secessionist groups began threatening to rip the country apart. You see, Lumumba's MNC had actually only won 33 of the total 137 seats in the new Congolese parliament. Although this was the largest single total of any other political party, nearly half of all of the MNC's votes came from just one province in Stanleyville, and it had very limited support in the capital and other major regions. With the outbreak of chaos, Lumumba's rivals in the resource-rich Katanga and South Kasai regions spotted an opportunity to grab power for themselves and immediately began trying to secede from the newly independent Congo. Also looking to protect their own interests, Belgian operatives began collaborating with the Katangese rebels as they saw Katanga as a base from which they could eventually topple Lumumba's government and establish a pro-Belgium unified Congolese government in the country's capital of Leopoldville. By the end of its second week as an independent state, Congo was in a critical condition. Internal security had completely collapsed, the army was in disarray, 
the white minority of Belgian civil servants, doctors and teachers began fleeing to Belgium and the rebels of Katanga and South Kasai continued threatening to break the country apart. In desperation, Lumumba dismissed all Belgian officers in the army and appointed his former personal aide Joseph Mobutu as army chief of staff. Although Mobutu had only received basic military training during his seven years in the colonial army, his ability to gain Lumumba's trust had just earned him his first major victory on the road to absolute power. As the crisis got from bad to worse, Lumumba publicly accused the Belgians of being at the heart of the crisis and appealed to the United Nations for help. Dissatisfied with the UN's response, Lumumba hastily turned to the Soviet Union for military assistance in his desperate attempt to restore internal order. And unfortunately for him, this move would ultimately prove to be his undoing. You see, Lumumba had long been on the CIA's watch list as a suspected communist sympathizer. And with his appointment as Congo's prime minister, Washington had been on high alert against the threat of increased Soviet influence in the Congo. And so with his appeal to the Soviet Union, the Americans felt that the suspicions about Lumumba had now been confirmed. Lumumba's actions would bring both Belgian and US interests into perfect alignment. And having agreed on the need to get rid of Lumumba, the only remaining question was about how to go about it. The perfect man for the job would be none other than Lumumba's newly appointed army chief of staff. Where most people saw chaos, Mobutu saw a golden opportunity. The Congolese crisis would be for him the perfect way to fast track his long-term political ambitions. By aligning himself to American and Belgian interests, Mobutu realized that he could use their military might to consolidate power for himself and create a perfectly symbiotic relationship between him and two of the world's most powerful countries. And so while Lumumba continued to accuse the Belgians of sabotage and desperately tried to rally up nationalist spirit, Mobutu publicly accused Lumumba of being a communist sympathizer and blamed him for the disorder in the Congolese army. Acting in collaboration with President Kazavubu, the Belgians and the Americans, Mobutu would go on to arrange for the capture and secret execution of the very same man that had brought him to the corridors of power. A new chapter begins in the dark and tragic history of the Congo with the return to Leopoldville of deposed Premier Lumumba, following his capture by crack commandos of strongman Colonel Mobutu. Taken to Mobutu's headquarters past a jeering, threatening crowd, Lumumba was impassive at this lowest ebb of his stormy career. Mobutu watched as his troops manhandled Lumumba, but promised the pro-red Lumumba a fair trial on charges of inciting the army to rebellion. Lumumba was removed to an army prison outside the capital as his supporters in Stanleyville seized control of Oriental province and threatened a return of disorder. Before that, Lumumba suffered more indignities, including being forced to eat a speech which he restated his claim to be the Congo's rightful premier. Even in bonds, Lumumba remains a dangerous prisoner, storm center of savage loyalties and equally savage opposition.